Hello and welcome to the eighth annual high level meeting of Caring for Climate, convened by the United Nations Global Compact together with the UN Environment Programme and UN Climate Change, and co hosted this year with the COP25 and COP26 climate champions. Thank you all for joining us, uh, joining us for this gathering of leaders from business, finance, subnational government civil society and the United Nations to reflect on progress and discuss ways to collectively ramp up climate action in the lead up to the five year anniversary of the adoption of the Paris Climate Agreement. I'm Dan Thomas, the Chief of Strategic Events and Communications here at the UN Global Compact. And before we get going for this event, I wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Hopin platform and also help you get the most out of your event experience today. With over 1,500 attendees from 35 countries, we encourage you to join the conversation in the event chat on the right-hand side of your screen. You can explore more in-depth topics in the content studios in the pavilion, and you can vote on questions in polls, and even connect directly with attendees, your fellow attendees, using the networking and people features here on the Hopin platform. For more information on the upcoming Climate Ambitions, Ambition Summit, the Race to Zero campaign, the Business Ambition for 1.5 degrees Celsius campaign, the Science-Based Targets Initiative and other helpful resources on climate change, please visit the pavilion on the left-hand side of your dashboard once in the pavilion, you can learn more about the UN Global Compact at the UN Global Compact booth too. And of course, we encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, using the hashtags Our Only Future and Caring for Climate. We have a very impressive group of leaders today who will share their views on climate action. And first, after a brief pause and countdown, you'll hear from Sander Ojiambo, the CEO and Executive Director of the United Nations Global Compact. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today for the high-level meeting of Caring for Climate. This is our eighth annual meeting convened with our partners, the United Nations Environmental Programme and UN Climate Change, and this year co-hosted with Race to Zero, 
a global campaign of the high-level champions for climate action, Mr. Nigel Topping and Mr. Gonzalo Munoz, who is here with us today. We are also honored to have leaders from government, business, UN and civil society joining us today to strengthen global efforts for bolder and more ambitious climate action from all stakeholders. Five years after the Paris Agreement was negotiated, we will reflect on the progress made since 2015 and how companies, cities and investors can help put the world on a path towards green recovery as we collectively deal with this pandemic. And on the eve of the Paris Accord anniversary, we are reminded that the promise of agreement remains an inspiration to us all. At the UN Global Compact, we are working with companies across the globe to make the goals of the agreement a reality. In 2015, along with our partners at CDP, WWF, and the World Resources Institute, we launched an ambitious effort, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, with the aim to enlist 250 companies by 2020. And today, more than 1,000 companies spanning 60 countries and nearly 50 sectors are working with the initiative to reduce their emissions at the pace and scale that is necessary. We are witnessing a transformation, but yet our current trajectory foresees global warming of more than 3% by the end of the century. There is still time to take the concrete, life-preserving action needed of all of us to ward off an untenable future, but only if we act decisively and urgently. With the campaign Business Ambition for 1.5 Degrees, we challenge companies to align their science-based targets with a 1.5 degree pathway to ultimately reach net zero emissions by 2050. The campaign is one of the initiatives under Race to Zero, which calls for radical collaborations to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. This year has indeed been a sobering one. The challenges that economies around the world have faced due to the COVID-19 pandemic are unlike any other in modern history. Pandemics do not recognize political boundaries and neither does climate change. Our impression is that the companies whose corporate ethos is driven by values, principles and leadership have proven their ability to respond to multiple crises and their resilience is a result. These companies have demonstrated their path to a greener recovery by prioritizing sustainable and inclusive growth. We need to scale up this movement by ensuring that science guides our efforts and businesses and governments around the world unite for a socioeconomic transformation to a zero carbon economy. In today's dialogue, we will also understand the role of business in helping governments enhance their nationally determined contributions and supporting partnerships and multilateralism for the strongest response to the climate emergency. Many of you have already contributed to, through your leadership and we thank you. But I urge you to continue to lead by supporting your governments and encouraging other corporates to work towards a net zero future. We stand ready to support you through our local networks around the world. Today, I look forward to meaningful dialogue moderated by Gonzalo Munoz. But first, let us hear from the United Nations Secretary General, His Excellency, Antonio Guterres. Thank you. I thank the UN Global Compact, UNFCCC, the High Level Climate Champions, and the UN Environment Programme for convening this meeting. I also extend my appreciation to all the leaders present today. It is encouraging to see how businesses are responding to the twin crises of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. Through business ambition for 1.5, more than 340 CEOs are stepping up to align their company emission targets with a 1.5 degree future and the goal to reach net zero well before 2050. And at the race to zero, these business leaders are joined by hundreds of mayors, governors and investors, universities and civil society organizations. Yet, Despite such promising developments, we are still far from where we need to be five years after the Paris Agreement. The world is off track and multilateralism itself is being questioned precisely when we need it most. To recover from the pandemic, we need effective climate action. In the process, we can create millions of jobs, promote cleaner technologies and vastly improve global health. 2021 must be the year in which the world leaps forward into a net zero future. To that end, I urge all of you to take or advocate for six climate positive actions. Invest in sustainable jobs. Ensure no more bailouts to polluters. Shift taxation from income to carbon, from taxpayers to polluters. And subsidies 
for fossil fuels, especially coal. Include climate risks in all decisions and disclose your climate-related financial risks. Work together with a common purpose to leave no one behind. I am pleased to say that we have seen some hopeful movement. The European Union, along with Japan, the UK, the Republic of Korea and more than 110 other nations, has pledged carbon neutrality by 2050. And China says it will be carbon neutral before 2060. By early next year, with the pledge of the incoming United States administration, I expect countries representing more than 65% of global carbon dioxide emissions and more than 70% of the world economy to have committed to carbon neutrality. I look forward to further ambitious commitments being announced at the Climate Ambition Summit on the 12th of December. These announcements sent unmistakable market signals to investors ready to fund a faster global transition. I urge you all to support a green recovery in your countries. I hope you will help your governments to strengthen their nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement well in advance of COP26 and consistent with the net zero pathway. I count on your leadership. Our collective future is at stake and I thank you. Welcome everyone to the eighth annual high level meeting of Caring for Climate. I am absolutely delighted to be introducing and moderating our first panel named From Paris to Glasgow, Progress on Climate Action Since 2015. This, this first panel will reflect, of course, on the progress to date since the Paris Agreement in 2015 and the reality that we are definitely not currently on track to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. However, there has been incredible progress in a wide variety of sectors, in, in many of them much more rapidly than anyone has projected. And, and we know now we have the opportunity of a lifetime to capitalize on this momentum that we are witnessing and to meet our climate goals. We are here today to highlight the highest priorities for growing those positive signals and accelerating action. Leaders will share their, the lessons they have learned on their net zero journey and how to build on that progress to redouble efforts in the face of growing impacts and risk. Hopefully, these lessons will help the audience to be inspired and feel encouraged to take very concrete action. So, so I'm really excited to introduce our three panelists, Mrs. Sandra Wu, chairperson and CEO of Kokuzai uh, Kogio Co Limited. Mr. Roberto Marquez, Executive Chairman and Group CEO of Natura and Company, and Mrs. Mary Shapiro, Vice Chair for Public Policy at Bloomberg LP and member of the TCFD Secretariat. A real well welcome to the three of you. It's a real honor to be moderating a panel with the such amazing experience and commitments you bring with your personal trajectory. So thanks a lot for being with us. And now first I would like to ask you all to introduce yourselves and tell us uh, uh, about uh, where you're joining us from. So first, if I can start with you, Sandra. Um, yeah, my name is Sandra. I'm joined from Japan. Thank you. Uh, Roberto. Hi, everybody. Uh, Gonzalo, thanks for, for having us. I'm excited to be on this panel with all of you and such an important issue. I'm uh, Roberto Marquez, and I'm actually calling from, uh, from the U.S. Perfect. Which part of the U.S.? I'm actually in New Jersey right now. New Jersey, East Coast. And, and how about you, Mary? I'm Mary Shapiro, and I'm joining from Washington, D.C. Great. So, Sandra, thanks a lot for joining this late in Japan. We know it's uh, 11 p.m. for you, so thanks for that extra effort. Um, and, 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 well, again, great to have all of you with us today. Thanks a lot. And, and I would like to start now our discussion with this particular question, uh, asking each of you to ask uh, to, to answer the same one. What are some of the steps your organization has taken on climate action since 2015? And how do you view the, prog the progress within your sector? So first I would like again to start with you, Sandra, please. 
Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. Well, but first of all, let me start by noting that uh, Koksai Kogyo is a geospatial solution company in Japan uh, with the track record of working with governments for over 70 years. We serve market in Asia. We've also been active in the field of international develop development for 50 years, but our main market is domestic. Well, you might remember Japan as the recipient of the Fossil Awards at the COP25, but the new Prime Minister has now committed to net zero by 2050. And even before that, there was a lot being done on the ground by both government and the non-state <coughs> sectors. And just to give you an idea, Japan has the second highest number of companies that are SBTI certified and second highest number of companies in the RE100 initiative and the highest number of TCFD supporting companies. And not only that, over 180 local governments, including Tokyo, uh, representing two thirds of the Japanese population, 83 million people are committed to become uh, carbon neutral by 2050. And this is the progress here in Japan. And there is one thing I believe, and I have always argued at the global events like this one, that the best way business can contribute to sustainability is through their business strengths. So Koksai Kogyo has walked my talk. Uh, in 2016, we revamped our corporate strategy, mid and long range plans to in line with the new global agendas, uh, including the Paris Agreement, SDGs, and the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. We mainstream resilience, sustainability, mm -hmm. and the climate action as our core guiding values. We also overhauled our product lineup. Uh, we identify areas where solutions are still lacking and directed our research and development resources to create them. And as a result, we continue to provide local governments the means, the solutions to make their net zero commitment a reality. And while we believe we can contribute the most through our business strengths, we also recognize the importance of becoming carbon neutral ourselves as an organization. So we joined SBTI and the business ambition for 1.5 degree in June 2020 uh, with a pledge to reduce emissions across our entire value chain. And we are in fact the first company in Japan in our sector, uh, the survey and the engineering consulting sector to commit to SBTI. It was very hard work for us getting to the pledge and even harder work uh, in delivering it, it's still ahead. But we got here and so can everyone. We hope to lead the sector by example and spread the ambition of net zero in our industry so that collectively we can accelerate and keep global warming to within 1.5 degrees as a society. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you. Well, th thanks so much, Sandra. Just let me also refer to uh, one aspect that uh, that is embedded into your narrative. The ultimate goal of the high-level champions is to activate the ambition loop, to mobilize non-state actors to be reflected at the end on the NDC enhancement from the countryside. And, and we are referring with Nigel this year that the best possible example that we have is Japan. Uh, what, you, what you have explained at the end it's exactly what we need to see in each of the countries of the world. So thanks so much, Sandra, for your work and, and through you to all of those business leaders and, 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 and majors as well, as they have done a great job. Uh, so uh, going now to you, Roberto, as, as Natura and companies, a company that is represented in so many countries on the world and maybe can help us again uh, to shine a light on those uh, leaders of the world for them to also enhance their ambition. And, and so many people, is, uh, and, 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 and I'm one of those, uh, are using Natura as the example of the path that hopefully uh, businesses can, can, can um, walk. So what are, what are some of those steps uh, for Natura and how do you view the progress within your sector? So, uh, good question, Gonzalo. So, uh, as you know, you know, I reflect, you know, since the Paris Agreement, a lot of things have changed for Natura. It became really a truly global company now with companies like Avon, the Body Shop, Natura, and Aesop. 
really reaching out over to 100 countries, 200 million customers, over 3,000 stores, and most important, 6 million consultants and representatives who are really entrepreneurs. And we, you know, very uh, uh, privileged to be able to work with all of them and transforming their lives uh, to some extent. In, in related to the climate crisis, you know, Natura's been carbon neutral since 2007. And, and since then, you know, uh, being able to reduce by a third its carbon emission. Uh, but we also try to hold ourselves even to a higher standard and pushing ourselves. Uh, uh, and for that, we, we recently, early this year, introduced our 2030 commitment to life, which put a target for us to become uh, uh, carbon zero, achieve uh, zero a net emission by 2030, right? Which is uh, almost 20 years earlier than the commitment with the United Nations. But the, the devil is on the details, as, uh, as we like to say. And, and this goes also uh, uh, embracing scope one, two, and three in terms of net zero, which is very daunting, very challenging, because it's not only related to our direct emission, but also what we purchase and consume. But most important on scope three is to become net zero on the end-to-end -end supply chain, which means that we needed to bring together our partners in supply chain uh, since we uh, are committing ourselves to that uh, very ambitious target. We don't know exactly how we're going to get there, but the important thing is, is bringing the collective, bringing those partners, really making them very much aware of the importance of really achieving this net zero uh, ambitions. Now to your second part of the question about how the sector is doing, we see progress, uh, uh, but I think it's fair to say that it's not, not enough where we are today, five years after the Paris Agreement. And I think the call out for us with our commitment to life that talks about you know, climate crisis, protecting the Amazon, how we build a, a society that is more inclusive and, and, and reduce inequality, and how we embrace uh, circularity as a whole and regeneration. It's a call to action to, to all of us and working with our industry, civil society, uh, science in a multilateral approach, because those are the only way that we're going to be able to find and, 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 and answer some of those very challenging questions that we face. Uh, I would like to finish this first question, uh, uh, Gonzalo, just saying for us, you know, there is no place for competition when you know, humanity is at risk. So the call to action is really for the power of the collective, all of us working together, you know, government, civil society, uh, 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 NGOs, in terms of really finding the solutions for those very challenging uh, uh, and daunting uh, uh, tasks that we have in front of us. Thanks so much, Roberto, and thanks to Natura and Co for the inspiration that you have set not only in the UN Global Compact community, but in the B Corp, the B Team, so many other communities and um, business communities that are uh, using the inspiration that Natura is bringing, and and that that work that Sandra and Roberto has explained is is incapable to be delivered without a financial market that is also aligned. Uh, so Mary. Um, Oh, I, I would like to not only uh, refer to the to the main questions, but it would be great to to listen to you about the um, uh, listen to you about the momentum around TCFD since it was created back in 2015. Thank you, Gonzalo. It's very nice to be here. And just to quickly remind everyone, the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, was announced five years ago at COP, and it was done in response to a Financial Stability Board request to try to improve the quality and the quantity of climate-related financial disclosure in the marketplace so that investors, lenders, and insurers could make better informed economic and capital allocation decisions um, to aid policymakers in understanding the impact of climate on the stability of the financial system and for central bankers and others, the ab ability to understand better what the impact of climate was on the individual financial institutions that they supervise and then more broadly to help smooth the transition to a low carbon economy. 
And I have to say that thanks to um, leaders across government, business, and finance, climate risk disclosure is seeing extraordinary uptake around the world. When we released our recommendations in 2017, we struggled to get 100 CEOs to publicly commit to supporting um, the need for better information on climate risk and an analysis of climate-related risks. Since then, the uptake, as I say, has been um, tremendous across public and private sector and really accelerated the adoption of the TCFD disclosure framework. Uh, what we've seen over the past three years is really broad appreciation by corporates that climate risk is indeed material financial risk. We've seen rapidly increasing demands from institutional investors for decision useful climate disclosures and a realization by the, the official sector that this disclosure is essential to the functioning of the capital markets and to countries' ability to meet net zero commitments where they've made them. So in terms of the numbers, we have over 1,600 supporters now, including com companies from 77 countries with a combined market capitalization of $15 trillion, and financial firms, including the world's largest asset owners, with responsibility for $150 trillion of assets, all supporting the TCFD. We've got more than 110 regulators and central bankers from around the world and 10 national governments that have endorsed TCFD, with two countries just in the last month or so, New Zealand and the UK, announcing the TCFD disclosure will be mandatory in their economies. And we're even seeing signs of progress in the United States, which is um, very good news and very heartening for me. Amazing. Thank you, Mary. And, and, and thank to the three of you for those inspiring stories. We, I mean, you are the truly climate champions. And, uh, and, and, and when we refer to our work with Nigel uh, as, as uh, champ climate champions being named by the UN, most of the time it's about celebrating the efforts and the commitments and, and, and goals of others. So that this is a moment when I have to clap and, and stand up and, and, and properly recognize all the work that you are doing. And then the other part of our work is to increase the ambition, like adding zeros in terms of the new members and, and, and showing also what is not only possible, but also what is now happening, right? So let's move to the part where I expect that you will now inspire others to join with very concrete uh, exam examples of, of how you're doing it. So in your case, Sandra, uh, your, your, your company's mission is to save the earth, make communities green, and you are involved in initiatives on renewable energy, including with local governments. H how does this help to align with your 1.5 uh, degree ambition? How do you mitigate some of the challenges you face? It would be great for the audience to learn uh, from Kukusai Kogyu. Um, yes, Gonzala, thank you for the question. Um, I mentioned that Japan now has over 180 aspiring zero carbon cities, but our local governments have been working since Paris uh, to meet a national 26% emission reduction target by 2030 and 80% by 2050. And in fact, they have been legally required to do so based on a 2016 law uh, in line with the Japan's NDC. So all local governments across Japan are, first of all, expected to mitigate 40% of the 2030 target through increased energy efficiency of their government offices and the public building. And additionally, larger local governments units have been required to plan and implement area-wide project tailored to their uh, specific local conditions, combining various means, uh, including renewable energy, local production and consumption of uh, energy, clean transport, zero in uh, energy homes and office, uh, enhancing carbon sinks such as forest, and many, many others option to achieve the rest of the 2030 targets. And this push to 2030 is meant to be a pilot to help each local government fine tune their next stage a roadmap to 2050. So in my view, the tide has def definitely turned and our market is now focused on a zero carbon society. To meet challenges, 
we created a unit in my company that act as a, a mitigation travel guide for local government clients. And within this unit, there is a planning team that works with cities to create their vision and an implementation team that identify and where necessary invent the means to achieve that vision. The planning team would, for example, help city um, put together a roadmap from all the options I mentioned earlier, uh, obtain subsidies and handle the monitoring and the reporting associated with uh, such funding. The implementation team would fill the gaps. For example, when city energy efficiency budgets are tight, we organize local businesses into in uh, equipment leasing agencies, which is a cost and energy saving head up set up that also stimulate the local economy. We help local governments establish the local power uh, companies PPS in addition to the physically building and uh, operating their renewable energy plants. We also connect a remote village to urban city district in energy partnership that benefit both parties by making a new renewable energy plant economically feasible to one and reduce the carbon footprint for of the others. These are some of the ways we uh, provide the local governments the means, the solutions to make their net zero commitment a reality. And our direct involvement in local business setup has been taken by local governments as proof of our investment and the commitment. So as a result, we are established a, as a strong partner in climate action, along with other stakeholders in many uh, communities across Japan. So that is all for my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And Roberto, uh, and, and, and adding a new challenge to, to keep the answer as brief as possible. We're running out short of time. So your company is one of the earliest Brazilian companies to commit to science-based targets initiative. And therefore, how, how can we create transformative change from early adopters to encourage wider adoption at the speed required? Yeah, Gonzalo, listen, w one of the key challenges that we still face, uh, even on science-based targets, is how we keep track of things, how we measure things, how we make sure that we create the same discipline as companies normally run their P&Ls and, you know, look at their market share. For that, I'd say it's very important to partner with the right uh, 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 companies or support it. And, and, and I would start saying, you know, for sure, uh, the UN Global Compact. You know, make sure that you connect with your local uh, uh, branches and, and chapters because they, they can help bring it to life, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development, Sustainable Development Goals, in a way that it becomes very tangible, right? Uh, another suggestion is uh, partner with the B Corp, the B Labs. I mean, they, they bring a, a, a very uh, practical, tangible ways that we can really track the progress that companies are doing in 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 emission, in climate, in 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 you know social inclusion, uh, in, in a way that facilitates a lot of companies that are starting this journey, right? And I would last but not least also talking about you know uh, uh, the task force on climate uh, financial disclosure. We are partnering now with them to make sure that we can really track those things and, and disclose those things in a very transparent way. So in a nutshell, uh, Gonzalo is, you know, uh, we can solve those things on our own. And, and I think a lot of companies have that still idea that they can find the solutions within themselves. It's very important to reach out and find the right expertise, find the right partners that can help, you know, really advance in that agenda. Thanks so much, Roberto. Uh, Mary, how are companies and investors transitioning to a net zero economy through greater transparency and disclosure? Well, it, it's, it's clear that without um, good climate-related financial information, markets can't adequately price climate-related risks and opportunities correctly. And as a result of that, they may face uh, companies and countries 
a rocky transition to the low carbon economy with sudden value shifts, destabilizing costs and industries aren't able to rapidly adjust to the new landscape. It's for that reason actually that the TCFD recommends that companies conduct scenario analysis to test the strategy, um, the resiliency of their strategies under different climate scenarios, one and a half degree, two degree and so forth. It's so important for the company to understand what the impact is from scenario analysis of, uh, on their strategy so that they can adjust their strategy if necessary. And of course, it's really important for investors to understand so they can direct capital to those companies that are best prepared in the face of climate change um, to take both take advantage of the opportunities and to manage and mitigate the risk. But I think importantly, um, We've spoken a couple of times this morning about uh, the number of countries and the EU working toward achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, 2060 in the case of China. There are over 100 countries doing that today. And many of those jurisdictions are going to legislate disclosure of climate related information in order to support the necessary market transparency to understand if industry is going to be on the path to transition in a way that will allow the national government to meet the commitments that it's made or whether additional policies or measures are necessary. So this um, this will really illuminate, I think, the way, uh, the way forward. And finally, I would note something I just learned a couple of weeks ago, as an example, the Irish Sovereign Wealth Fund has said it will not invest in companies that do not have a transition plan. And a large number of other sovereign wealth funds, in fact, representing about $30 trillion of assets under management, have recently committed to engaging their investee companies in TCFD disclosure for the same reason. They want to invest in companies that have a plan and are on the path to achieving uh, net zero. Thank you, Mary. And, and, and our final question as we wrap up this first panel, could you please name one action or project your organization has worked on to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement that you would encourage all your peers to take, and I would go the opposite, starting with Mary. Well, this won't surprise anyone. I really encourage um, companies to to support the TCFD disclosure framework. It's scalable. It works around the world. Uh, it's it's comfortable because it looks at issues in the same way that you you generally look at risk. Um, of any type of across the company to support the TCFD and to begin the path on the path of actually implementing the recommendations and, and providing the disclosure to the marketplace. Thank you. Roberto, very quickly. Yeah, for us, again, you know, a partner with uh, institutions like B Corp, right? Uh, very important. Uh, we've been certified. We extend their certification now to you know, uh, the body shop this year to ESOP. We just uh, been recertified as Natura, as a company now as a Natura and Co group. Uh, that is very important. I also would uh, mention, you know, uh, make sure that you also protect our natural resources. At Natura, we have a firm commitment to protect the Amazon, uh, which is such an important component of us achieving, you know, net zero uh, emission. Thanks so much. And finally, Sandra, please. Yes. Um, in my company and actually in all of Japan, we tend to work on mitigation and adaptation hand in hand. Uh, for example, why I only mentioned the mitigation earlier, local government mitigation plans in Japan contain many embedded elements of adaptation and disaster resilience guided by the national uh, policy document and the subsidy. Uh, sub subsidy requirements. However, when I look around globally, I notice mitigation and adaptations to, are still in silos. So this pandemic is a wake up call. We need to urgently address our short term resilience as well as our long term future. So my message to my peer is we need to take both mitigation action and adaptation action to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sandra, Mary, Roberto, for the work that you're doing and the inspiration that you brought. It's been an, a privilege to be moderating this panel. Uh, 
has been great contribution to the conversation and and uh, and, and of course to all the participants who have been engaging with us. Uh, now, after a, a one minute break, we will continue with our second discussion named Ambitious Goals for a Green Recovery and NDC Enhancement. So we'll go now for a one minute video and be back here with the next panel. Thank you very much. making any changes and we continue with business as usual on CO2 emissions is a very scary world. It's a world where you have extreme weather events, where we're facing water shortage, food shortage, so it's a catastrophic uh, scenario and we do not want that. UN Global Compact, together with the World Resources Institute, World Wildlife Fund, CDP and other professional organizations in this space, um, is working to try to get 20% of all major corporations in each major sector to commit to fully decarbonize. Because we believe once you get 20% to a quarter, to a third, it then becomes unstoppable. Uh, companies that internalize climate action disclose their climate-related risks in their value chain, might have a price on carbon, have active decarbonization plans in place, are more profitable and are growing faster. Climate change is all about carbon emission. Carbon emission is all about energy, the way we consume it, the way we produce it. So we have to consume less and we have to produce it better. Global issues cannot be done by just one single company or a single industry nor a single country. So we all have to come together, uh, take the all of society approach to achieve it. Great, so I'm really excited now to be introducing our second panel named Ambitious Actions for a Green Recovery and NDC Enhancement. This second panel will reflect on 2020. We cannot leave that reality aside. In, in the face of the global health and economic crisis brought on by COVID-19, study after study have made clear that the only option for in inclusive sustainable recovery is one that puts climate action at its core, investing in resilience and emission reduction to drive innovation, growth, and job creation. We look now to our three panelists to highlight actions that can help ensure an inclusive and green recovery and, and ways to support governments to enhance the national atomic contribution, as I expressed in the previous panel, what we call the activation of the ambition loop. So, so I'm really excited to introduce our three panelists, Mrs. Marcy Frost, Chief Executive Officer at CalPERS, Mr. Omed Ahmed, Chief Executive Officer at Artistic Millionaires, and Mr. Torben Morgan Pedersen, Chief Executive Officer at Pension Denmark. First, uh, let me welcome the three of you and thank you for being with us. I would like to ask you all to introduce yourself and tell us uh, where are you joining from? So first, Mrs. Marcy Frost. Uh, good morning, at least good morning on uh, where I'm at. I'm Marcy Frost and I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the California Public Employees Retirement System. And, and I believe that you're connecting from the West oh, Coast. I am, I am connecting from Washington State. Great. Thank you. Thank you for being this early, Marcy. Mr. Yes. Orme, o, Omer Ahmed. Uh, hi. Thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, this is uh, Omer Ahmed. I'm Chief Executive at Artistic Millionaires. Uh, and we are a denim manufacturing company based out of Pakistan. Thank you. And Mr. Torben Morgan Pedersen. Well, uh, thank you for this opportunity to contribute to a very uh, relevant and uh, uh, interesting uh, discussion. Uh, my name is Torben Morgan and I'm the CEO of uh, Pension Denmark, uh, located in Copenhagen. And uh, I'm actually in my office right now. It's uh, late afternoon in Denmark at the moment, so that's why it's a little uh, dark. Uh, uh, behind me, and the, the nice uh, red brick building you can see uh, over my shoulder is actually the, the new headquarter of the Danish Central Bank, 
So we are located very close to, to big money. So we are really satisfied with this uh, new uh, location. Thank you. Thank you all again for the effort of connecting in different time zones uh, and, and really great to have you all with us. Let's start with our discussion. My first question would be for the three of you. Uh, 2020 has been marked by COVID-19 pandemic, definitely. Can you tell us more about the impact that pandemic had on your institution uh, or company? So first, Marcy. Yes, th uh, thank you. That's a, a great question. <laughs> I, you know, when we think about the impacts of COVID-19, there are two that uh, really have had more of a dramatic impact for us. And so the first one would be the portfolio impact uh, itself. And then the second would be on our workforce, our employees, and getting everyone ready uh, to work remotely, getting everyone out of the building and connected uh, as promptly as we possibly could in order to keep productivity at the levels that we had prior to, to COVID. So on the portfolio side, we were pleased to be able to report in our fiscal year return that we were able to get a 4.7 um, out of the markets, uh, which was a positive uh, message that uh, in an environment where many of our peers were really in that 3.1 to 3.2 benchmark range to have CalPERS be able to accomplish a 4.7 uh, and really taking advantage of some of the preliminary work that we had done around risk mitigation, uh, drawdown risk, uh, really advantage the fund by about $11 billion. And then, uh, you know, we, we were able to also put together uh, some uh, strategies and opportunities uh, that we saw in the market with the dis dislocation that was happening, we were able to put some uh, money to work uh, for the beneficiaries as well. So, you know, overall, uh, coming through the, the pandemic, the portfolio uh, performed pretty well, even though it didn't hit our benchmark of 7%, our return target, uh, which is unfortunate uh, in that, you know, sending this out to our public employers who pay for that unfunded liability side of the, the pension system, that is not you know, a positive message that we certainly wanted to get out, but a very positive message about what we were able to get out of the markets during those conditions. And then our employees are doing, uh, they're, they're just doing outstanding. Our customer service ratings remain extremely high. Uh, the team's morale remains high. We're working on, you know, that future of the workforce around, you know, how many of the employees were actually will stay in a remote environment versus how many will come back on premise uh, in a part-time uh, capacity. But overall, a positive story, but certainly challenges and challenges remaining for both the portfolio and the workforce. Thanks, Marcy. I can imagine how challenging and, and definitely what you have reflected are having part of our personal histories all around the world. Let me go now to Omer. Omer, please, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the impact that the pandemic had on, on artistic millionaires? Well, Gonzalo, the impact is we, we're still uh, feeling that impact uh, from an economic standpoint. And of course, uh, uh, you know, from a workforce uh, standpoint as well, like Marcy mentioned, you know, the safety of our workforce is our utmost priority uh, and, and remains that with the second wave pretty much in uh, action. So uh, we just trying to find new ways of working. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, April may have been extremely tough were extremely tough for us from a business standpoint as well. Uh, but we have seen uh, a pre pretty uh, decent recovery. You can call it pent up demand. Uh, and uh, now uh, it's kind of tapering off and business is getting a little more, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's just tapering down a bit. And so, I mean, things are still uncertain, but, uh, you know, there we put some strategies in place, which we, uh, think will be important uh, going into 2021. And one is, of course, uh, digitization of business. Uh, a lot of functions because, you know, this is in the denim business, we never thought we could work digitally as effectively as we are now uh, because in denim, it's, it's a touch field business. And uh, so in, in that sense, uh, we have digitized because we've had to. And uh, we've seen positive results uh, in the sense that, of course, travel in our business is down by 90%. Uh, I mean, more than 90%. So, uh, you know, the, the carbon footprint is lower automatically by that. And also, we have had, for some reason, we've been able to have more time uh, speaking to our customers about things that matter. And uh, sustainability is one of those things and how we can cut down waste. Uh, we weren't having a lot of these discussions uh, let's say pre-pandemic, and um, 
so there's a lot more focus on uh, macro uh, numbers on sustainability for instance the energy mix that we use and the water consumption the natural resources and how we are using them and of course even from a ingredient mix from a product mix uh, what we're using so uh, I, i think in the in the last six months uh, the biggest positive has been uh, that we're having more meaningful uh, conversations uh, with our clients which is helping us better Uh, align uh, our, our corporate strategy and of course the biggest conversation through it all uh, is uh, our sustainable initiatives brilliant thank you omar thank you for the question and thank you for the work uh torben would like to hear from you what, are, what has been the impact of the pandemic at pension denmark well uh, uh, of course uh, the pandemic has been a, a hard uh, Uh, strike for uh, many of uh, the members of our uh, pension fund. We we, uh, we are a pension fund for blue collar workers in in Denmark. We have several hundred fifty thousand members, and uh, many of them have been uh, locked down, uh, have lost their jobs, uh, which also means that uh, their uh, their contributions to the pension plan has been uh, somehow uh, reduced. But uh, luckily, uh, because of the strong res- policy response from central bank and uh, government, uh, the 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 uh, The effect on the let's say the overall macro economy has been limited, and uh, uh, some uh, industries have been hit uh, hard: uh, restaurants, uh, hotels, some service uh, industries. But in general, uh, for example, in, in the in the building and construction industry, where many of our members are employed, uh, we have actually maintained um, a, a full level of uh, activity during the, the crisis. Uh, in in our company, we had. Uh, to uh, send people home and work from from home in in the spring, and now we are in the middle of let's say a soft uh, lockdown where approximately 50% percent of our workforce uh, work from from uh, from their their private homes. But uh, as we, ha- we as we are a very digitalized uh, company, uh, we actually have been able to maintain uh, uh, full service level and uh, full productivity in both the. Uh, There's a patient administration and in our investment investment business. Uh, so uh, this has really, as uh, Omar said, uh, uh, strengthens our belief in the need to have a strong uh, and high level uh, when it comes to uh, use of uh, digitalization in uh, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a financial company like uh, ours. When it comes to the uh, results on the uh, let's say uh, investment side. If you have asked me back in uh, April, uh, in March, April, it, it looked uh, quite uh, uh, dark. But uh, because of the, uh, the strong policy response, uh, financial markets have uh, recovered uh, substantially, and as I think uh, everybody knows. And uh, actually, it now seems that we will uh, uh, end uh, 2020 with a very attractive uh, total return on uh, the on our uh, investments and our members' uh, savings. And I think with what is encouraging. It's the fact that uh, if you look at stock markets, the companies uh, who have performed uh, best are those uh, with a strong uh, sustainability uh, orientation bias. And I think that uh, for the first time uh, in 2020, we have seen a strong move among global uh, investors uh, as managers towards uh, to giving priority to uh, sustainable uh, companies. And as we have a, a strong exposure to this segment of the stock markets, we've actually benefited from it uh, in, in this uh, crisis year. Uh, so uh, uh, the savings of our members have uh, performed uh, very well, and uh, we hope that uh, they will be back in job uh, when the effect of the uh, stimulus packages uh, run through the uh, uh, economy. And I must say, I must say, I'm very proud of uh, my sta- staff, uh, my, my team. They have. Uh, Performed uh, really responsible, and uh, although it has been challenging working from, uh, let's say, your kitchen table instead of uh, from your office, they have done it uh, a, a great job. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and that's one of the reasons that we uh, here on Friday uh, at the so-called IPE Awards I got the uh, prestigious award as uh, the best pension fund in Europe, which we are very proud of, and. Uh, I have uh, celebrated that uh, in how you can do that now, but we have done that uh, for all our employees uh, on, on Friday. So we are very proud of this uh, position. Thank you. Thank you, Torben. Uh, if I can make a quick summary of these answers, I would say uh, the three of you 
express how important it is to put people first, but I would say we have moved toward putting empathy first, right? Because adapting all of the, all of the, the not only the way to work, but also positioning the health of the people in the center has been probably one of the main learnings and lessons from this pandemic. So thanks for, for that. And, and, I, and I hear from each of you about tackling the opportunities at the same time. And I would now would like to move to that part of the, of the equation, right? So starting with you, Marcy. As early, earlier this year, CAPES released its first climate change uh, risk assessment report, which found that 20% of its investment are in sectors vulnerable to climate change, including, of course, energy, forestry, transportation, food, and agriculture. How are you working with these companies to reduce the risk and hopefully to manage the opportunity that is reflected there? Yeah, thank you. You know, I would, you know, would certainly start by saying that uh, there are certainly risks associated with climate change, but we also believe that there are significant opportunities that we would be able to, to see. So our, you know, our climate strategy is really rooted in our fiduciary responsibility, and we like to add you know, an F into ESG, if you will, that there's a finance part uh, to environmental, social, and governance issues as well, and CalPERS being able to accomplish its 7%. Uh, that finance part is extremely important with 20% of the CalPERS uh, real assets and private equity asset classes invested uh, in climate solutions. So whether that's renewable energy as one example in real assets or some of our uh, GPs uh, who are invested in more clean tech or clean energy. So, you know, we're really addressing both the risks and the opportunities through a uh, three-pronged approach. The first one is uh, engagement uh, to ensure the companies where we're placing our capital or the capital of our beneficiaries uh, that they bring down their green gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's extremely important to the long-term risks associated with running a portfolio like CalPERS. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have identified climate risk as one of the top three uh, risks associated to the portfolio over the long term. Uh, the second part of our strategy is around advocacy to support policy and regulatory frameworks that would be necessary, whether that's transparency and how companies um, are thinking about climate related financial disclosures, the TCFD report, we did that uh, on our own portfolio. Uh, our result is, you know, we're not satisfied with, with our result, but it certainly gives us a benchmark to work from. Uh, we want regula regulation that uh, prices carbon. So we are engaged actively here in the United States with the SEC, both on carbon pricing as well as human capital metrics. And then integration is to bring consideration of climate change risk and opportunity into every decision that we make for the portfolio. So, you know, the strategy around engagement is also based on partnerships that we have. Uh, we were a co-founder of Climate Action 100 Plus. Uh, which uh, now has a number of uh, international as well as U.S. plans. Uh, we are uh, United Nations, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. I was very privileged and honored to be able to join uh, that group. I just recently joined a council uh, with the Vatican that uh, is really focused as one of its components on climate change, another on human capital, uh, board governance, which I think there's a high correlation between all three of those. And, you know, the strategies, I think these strategies are gaining momentum. I think there is a lot more attention from shareholders. Uh, we don't necessarily have shareholders at uh, CalPERS, but we have a number of very active and engaged stakeholders. Uh, so, you know, Climate Action 100 is uh, now has about 545 signatories with combined assets of just about $52 trillion. Uh, this is almost half of the world's um, managed money. So when Climate Action 100 Plus gets engaged, we are actually seeing quite a bit of success in those engagements with those companies on commitments to get to net zero by 2050. But we want to know what, what is happening in the intermediate. We can't just flip the switch for 2050. We want to know what you're doing in 2021, 2025, 2030. Are you transitioning appropriately? And how can we quicken that pace away from that 2050 and get it closer to the 2030, 2035 uh, Mark, which is where, re really where the state of California uh, has come out very clearly with Governor Gavin Newsom and, and stating that uh, transition to a lower carbon economy in California needs to happen much, much uh, sooner. So we think that these engagement platforms have tremendous opportunity um, and uh, we're looking forward to continuing uh, that engagement. And again, as I mentioned, we did complete the TCFT report on our own portfolio. We have a benchmark against now where we can measure our strategies and how effective the engagement, the advocacy, and the investment decision process are. 
processes are for CalPERS, and we'll be able to measure that over the long term. I would say we would do an updated TCFD report to the extent possible every 12 to 24 months just to see how we're making progress, creating our own scorecard as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy, and thank you so also for setting the importance of the interim targets. I think that's really, really important to, to refer to. Um, now back to you, Omer. Artistic Millionaires has committed to reach net zero emissions by 2050 uh, through the business ambition for 1.5 of the UN Global Compact. You are officially a member of Race to Zero. Thank you and congrats for that. Uh, can you please tell us more about your recent commitment that comes at a time when the world faces a global pandemic? Yeah, again, you know, the, the pandemic has, uh, you know, made us take a step back and, and reassess our climate impact and what we need to do now to enable a cleaner future. And that's why when we, when we found out about uh, business ambition uh, for 1.5, it, it resonated uh, very well with our overarching uh, climate strategy. Uh, and so through this uh, public commitment, you know, we uh, will take more streamlined actions uh, to minimize our carbon footprint uh, throughout the value chain and um, also lead by example, you know, as, as we focus on a cleaner energy mix. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, 30% uh, of our uh, energy mix is already on solar. And we're going to we're planning to expand that. And it's uh, and as you know that you know solar cost uh, and renewable energy cost in general has been coming down uh, quite significantly on a year-on-year -year basis. And uh, so these projects are becoming much more feasible for us uh, to implement. So that's why, uh, if you ask me, a decade ago, 2050 would seem ambitious, but now with you know all all these. Um, uh, renewable energy initiatives, uh, you know, coming down in cost, uh, it's uh, it, it seems like it's possible. And uh, if you even if you look at um, you know uh, uh, wind farms and uh, you know renewable energy in that sense is also uh, coming down in cost. And Artistic Millionaires actually owns a subsidiary by by the name of Artistic Energy, uh, which in the last five years has spent over a hundred million dollars uh, on uh, on wind farms. Uh, and we are currently um, uh, powering around 20,000 households in, in, in Pakistan with, with uh, this wind energy. So uh, in that sense, uh, you know, we are trying to do our part uh, to, to offset our greenhouse gas emissions in our core business, which is the jeans business, um, uh, by, by investing in other projects. And the government has been very supportive. Uh, you know, on, on these uh, sustainable initiatives, be it solar, be it wind. Uh, and most recently, we're also, uh, you know, investing and, and working on a, uh, on a hydro energy. So we're basically using, uh, you know, these run of the river sites uh, up north, uh, north of Pakistan. And um, uh, yeah, so we're investing in that. Those, are, those projects will be ready in five years as well. So we're going to be adding another 100 megawatts uh, to, to the grid in Pakistan of 100% uh, renewable energy and 0% uh, greenhouse gases. So we are very excited about that and uh, we're only pressing forward and it's made us actually even more committed now uh, given the whole pandemic uh, situation. Thank you so much, Omer. Thank you for, as you said, uh, leading by example, walking the talk and really hoping that that will that inspire will inspire all of the various stakeholders with which you're working around setting and advancing the green economy in Pakistan. So really look forward to continue working with you towards COP26. Torben, um, the, the Danish pension funds have committed $50 billion for a green transition in Denmark. How have you worked with the Danish government to ensure a green recovery? Yes, that's right. Uh, last year in September, the Danish pension fund industry made a very strong pledge at the UN Climate Week in New York, saying that we, during the next decade, will increase our green investments with 50 billion US dollars, and we are accountable. So every year we are making a status saying, how are we actually proceeding towards these targets? And I can tell you that in the first year, uh, we have actually managed to increase our total investments in this area with 7 billion US dollars. So we are ahead of the curve, so to say. And uh, 
And you're right, uh, it is, uh, is a way for us to uh, support the very ambitious uh, goals uh, made by the Danish parliament, saying that by 2030, uh, Denmark has to reduce uh, our total CO2 emissions with 70% compared with 1990. And uh, in order to, to fulfill this uh, really ambitious uh, goal, we have to mobilize the private funding at a very large scale. This is even more clear now than a year ago because the consequences of the, the, the corona crisis is a very strong, uh, let's say, uh, pressure on the public finances. You have been using uh, billions of uh, dollars, euros to support the economy, which means that uh, the investments necessary for the green transition must now, for, for to an even larger scale, come from uh, pension funds, other long-term uh, investors. Uh, this is uh, uh, we have uh, re reconfirmed our, uh, our our pledge, and uh, actually find it very uh, uh, comfortable because in this low interest rate environment, <coughs> all long-term investors are looking for <coughs> alternative investments, just like uh, Marci from Calpas uh, told us uh, before. And actually, in the area of uh, green infrastructure like uh, wind farms. Uh, biomass power plants and things like that, we find very attractive uh, investments also from a, a purely return uh, perspective. Um, we started uh, more than 10 years ago uh, investing directly in, uh, in uh, renewable energy infrastructure at, uh, in, uh, in Denmark, then in uh, Northern Europe, uh, then we moved to North America. And uh, during the last few years, we have uh, moved to, 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 to Asia, where we are now involved in uh, large offshore wind projects in uh, Taiwan. Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Australia, and probably also during the next year in, uh, in India. So we can actually uh, combine uh, our uh, investment capacity with the experiences from the Danish uh, uh, green energy uh, sector to uh, provide the Asian countries with a fully financed totally turnkey uh, project uh, 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 approach, which has been very well received in, the, in these uh, uh, countries. We've done the same in our let's say, real estate portfolio. As you all know, uh, real estate is uh, responsible for a very large part of the global uh, CO2 emission. And by uh, retrofitting existing uh, real estate and by uh, ensuring that uh, new investments in, in the real estate are at the, uh, the highest uh, possible level for, 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 for climate uh, impact, we can actually make a very strong uh, contribution. And uh, we are happy to say that uh, the the demand among tenants for sustainable buildings, both uh, when it comes to housing and offices, are uh, very strong. So this is another example of how to do good and do well at uh, the, the same uh, time. And uh, as uh, uh, Marcia also mentioned, uh, during the last couple of years, you, you've seen a very uh, a positive uh, increase in the cooperation in the global institutional investor community. Uh, Marcin mentioned the Climate Action 100 Plus. Uh, we are uh, involved in the uh, European branch. It's called IAGCC, Institutional Investors uh, Group on Climate Change, where I took over the position as uh, a vice chair uh, last week. And uh, we uh, expect to uh, do more in this area in the coming years in close cooperation with other long-term investors in, in order to help uh, companies to transform the business models in a climate-friendly uh, way by engaging also with, let's say, with uh, the, uh, let's say, black companies and black industries and help them to become a part of the uh, solution. So uh, I think the, the prospects are actually very interesting. Uh, and uh, as you need a, a green restart of the economies built back better, I think that uh, investors like us uh, have uh, both and a great responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Torben. Um, I would like to ask each of you a final and quick question uh, as we wrap up this, uh, this second panel. Uh, the pandemic, as we have spoken, has affected us all and would like to hear from each of you um, if, if you could share one step your company or organization has taken to ensure green recovery for, for others to follow. Just a very inspirational final word. And I will go the opposite way. So, Torben, a very concrete and sharp answer to this question. Well, uh, 
Yeah, I think that uh, this is an area where uh, you have uh, a very interesting uh, a window of opportunity to combine our need for identifying new types of investments with uh, our need to uh, allocate substantial investments into the green uh, transition. Uh, we are specialized in uh, uh, investment in green infrastructure uh, um, uh, uh, assets like uh, on and offshore wind farms. And I think that what we will uh, see in 21 is the first floating offshore wind farms in uh, Japan and in, uh, in California, where we uh, are very uh, excited about uh, the opportunities to uh, uh, invest in uh, those type of facilities uh, uh, on deep sea uh, levels. So when we meet next year, I probably will be able to show you a model of a floating offshore Californian wind farm close to Mars's uh, offices. Thank you. Omer, what will be your answer to the question, the inspiration? So, so we're taking a we're taking a two-pronged approach, right? So one is the macro in which we are uh, determined to scaling up on the renewable energy that we use to uh, power our equipment and machines. Uh, and from a product perspective, circularity. Uh, we want to close the loop. We want to cut down waste. We want to uh, recycle, reuse, and reduce uh, the natural resources we've been using so far. And this is really uh, a passion right now in our company, uh, as well as in the denim industry at large. Uh, this seems to be the main focus. Thank you. And finally, Marcy, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, as, you know, as an asset owner, uh, you know, CalPERS roughly $430 billion fund. Uh, you know, the one concrete example I would give is that we've done the TCFD uh, financial disclosure reporting on our own portfolio, and we're using that to actively and aggressively engage with the companies about how they will reduce their greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And uh, whether that's through Climate Action 100 plus, whether that's through proxy, uh, we're starting to see some great success. But I think the the whole issues, all of the issues related to COVID, all of the issues related to, you know, shareholder activism and this, you know, much more um, apparent and uh, educated group of people really thinking about the planet, thinking about people longer term. Uh, it get, gave us really more permission and authorization to move forward in a much more aggressive way. So uh, we'll continue to uh, match up the science and, and finance to do this, but uh, we're seeing a good success from a number of companies making these commitments to us. Thank you so much. Thank you to the three of you. I think that uh, you have said a very concrete opportunities for everybody, starting by acknowledging the size and the depth of the crisis that we're living nowadays, working around the, the possibility of building from the end. possibilities and tools. So thank you uh, for, for your great contributions to, to this conversation and to all of the participants who have been engaging with us. Um, we, we have heard from businesses and investors on the need to build on our achievements and scale up to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. And, 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 and that government's action through a stimulus packages and NDC plays a crucial role in our efforts to reduce global emissions. This has been very clear. Now, before handling to Mr. Satya Tripathi for the third panel, I want to specially thank uh, the UN Global Compact, their CEO, Sanda Oyambo, and her team for an amazing partnership with the Climate Action Champions since the beginning of the agenda back in 2015. And since last year, the business ambition for 1.5 has inspired and shined a light for many others to follow how, as we have, we have heard today. And it, this type of partnership and collaboration is setting the path towards a successful COP26 in Glasgow next year. I will now hand over to Mr. Satya Tripathi, UN Assistant Secretary General and Head of UN, UN uh, New York's office for the third panel titled for an inclusive multilateralism and radical collaboration to implement the Paris Agreement. Thank you all. Really look forward to continue working with you towards a successful COP26 in Glasgow. Thank you. We're going to galvanize the global retail industry to commit to net zero by 2040. We're going to build a new zero carbon 
electricity system which can provide 60% of all our energy eventually. We are going to leave no one behind as we work on reducing all the inequalities whilst we engage youth, women, people living with disabilities and also the indigenous groups. We are going to speak with our own money. Money we put into our own pension, money with insurance companies or banks. Feel confident saying that the time for net zero transport has come. We're going to revolutionise the sector using the actions of states, regions, corporates, cities and civil society. We want the WHO manifesto with the six prescriptions to be implemented in countries and cities. We're going to work together for the adequate protection of water resources, freshwater ecosystem and people. We are going to scale regenerative agriculture worldwide by empowering farmers and corporates to transition their agricultural systems. We are going to expand our use of nature-based solutions to meet our carbon neutrality goals and to build our resilience to accelerating climate-driven threats. We are going to amplify the voices of the poor and most vulnerable communities in Africa who are least responsible for greenhouse gas emissions and most impacted by climate change. The connection between human and nature should be rebuilt. Nature-based solutions have three principles. Multi-stakeholder mobilization, synergetic strategy, and a systematic approach. We can do this by communicating the urgency of the challenge and the achievability of the solutions. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Gonzalo, for those fascinating two panels uh, that you moderated. It has given us very significant insights into what we can do in different spheres everyone. of action Thank you, Gonzalo. moving forward in the next That's decade. Two panels. Now, we are on to this panel for an inclusive multilateralism and radical collaboration to implement the Paris Agreement, Different because nothing less will do. Moving forward. We have three amazing panelists, Alan Job, Chief Executive Officer of Unilever, Valentina Minta, Founder of West Blue Consulting, and Mark Crandall, Founder and Director of CWP Renewables. The 2020s have been dubbed the decade of action for accelerating sustainable solutions to all the world's biggest challenges ranging from poverty and gender to climate change, inequality, and of course, closing the finance gap. This will require not only bold targets, but unprecedented collaboration by non-state actors and governments to drive implementation. And who better than the three panelists we have today to give us some very meaningful insights. Unilever is part of the business ambition for 1.5 campaign, has science-based targets for a 1.5 degree trajectory and has signed the United Business and Governments to Recover Better Statement. Um, they have, they're also part of Caring for Climate, Carbon Pricing Leadership Criteria, Responsible Climate Policy Engagement, um, and, and I could go on and on. Ms. Minta is on the Executive Board of the International Chamber of Commerce, and, and she will provide the SME perspective, as we know, there are 350 million SMEs um, around the world. And while the conversation has centered around the, the global majors like Unilever and others, but it is also important to engage the SMEs because in many countries around the world, they could be 98% of the carbon footprint. And Mark Crandall of CWP Renewables, CWP, um, is, is a founding partner of the world's biggest green hydrogen project, Green Hydrogen Catapult. And, uh, and, and he will be offering us uh, amazing insights as we uh, proceed with the discussions today. Let me start by asking all of you, I mean, it's great to have you with us. Um, and we're talking about an inclusive multilateralism. How can we bring um, everybody together, creating uh, the coalition of the virtuous uh, to improve world governance. We need to draw on civil society, cities, businesses, local authorities, and more and more on young people. So let me ask each one of you the same question. Why is it crucial to bring everyone into this global conversation on the climate crisis? 
Um, let me start by inviting Valentina. Thank you, Satya, and good day to our audience. Um, if there's one thing that the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us, it is that we're only as strong as our weakest link. And similar to climate change, the effects are non-discriminatory. Inclusion and collaboration are therefore no longer nice to have, but critical action items that must take effect in our 2020s decade of action, as we've named it. Now, I'm sure many of us are also aware that without concerted action from all stakeholders in 10 years, climate change's devastating effects and our relationship with the natural world would have fundamentally changed life as we know it. You mentioned young people. Children and young people face the worst effects of the damage we will cause on their future. The impact of climate change are already being felt. The intensity and frequency of severe weather events are leading to drought, failing crops, water shortages, and forced migration, not to mention the destruction of infrastructure and the economic ramifications that this brings. Also, more than half of the world's total GDP is already moderately or highly exposed to risks from nature's losses. At the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, as the institutional representative of over 45 million businesses worldwide, and also the voice of the real economy, we believe that it's time to open our eyes to the value of taking action on climate and bio biodiversity loss. Now, we're often presented with a view that business simply can and should do more. But the reality is that a business's ability to scale environmental efforts isn't just limited by the will of its leadership but the collective efforts of all actors in the ecosystem. That's why as we approach the five year anniversary of the Paris Agreement at ICC, we see a need for genuine systems change involving all actors, small and large, to provide a basis for a resilient rebuild from COVID-19 and achievement of the goals of the Paris Agreement and also the SDGs more broadly. From private sector perspective, the supply chain leaders need to ensure that their shifts to sustainable procurement are not predicated on threats and that these actions are coupled with support, guidance and tools that are accessible throughout their value chains. Now looking at governments, governments need to develop provisions to create accelerated pathways for systems transformation while creating regulatory environments which reward and enable long-term investments in resilience and sustainability. So certainly the role of radical collaboration and cooperation of everyone, government and private sector, citizens, young and old, in this effort cannot be overstated and therefore the need for collaboration, collaboration, collaboration cannot be overstated, Satya. Thank you, Valentina. Alan? Uh, thank you very much, Satya. Let me build on a couple of points that uh, Valentina has made. Um, first of all, uh, capitalism has done a wonderful job in many regards. It's still an excellent system for allocation of resources, uh, capitalism has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It's been a spur to competition and innovation. It is the mechanism by which we reward risk. But there are two huge problems in the world, which is climate change and deepening inequality in many parts of the system. And we're now at a point where capitalism is contributing to those problems. And we need to turn the tables and have capitalism be part of the solution. And so the new model of capitalism that's emerging is one that has several characteristics, but the, the kind of opening one is an adoption of this so-called multi-stakeholder model. And at Unilever, we truly believe that when we take care of our employees and let them take care of our customers, when we treat our business partners with respect, when we do good by the societies where we operate, and take care of the planet, 
as a consequence, our shareholders will be preferentially rewarded. And that multi-stakeholder model of capitalism has got collaboration built into it. And so if we want to avoid a world where we've got runaway climate change and rampant inequality, it begins with a model of business that acknowledges the role for all different stakeholders collaborating to solve these big problems in an economically viable way. Thank you, Alan, for highlighting that stakeholder value unlocks true value for the shareholders as well. Uh, Mark? Uh, Alan, that was a great speech. I couldn't agree with you more. So I, I wanna just add one thing sort of in defense of capitalism. I think capitalism is really good at getting things done, but capitalists tend to be sort of ruthless about only doing what's best for them. So part, part of the multilateral approach that we need to achieve here is to make sure that we're not asking people to fall on their own swords. If we have common rules, a new common playing field, we can achieve enormous things. But to do that, we can't have free riders. So if we say to people, listen, it would be better not to emit carbon, and we need to make it true for everybody so that one person can't emit carbon and the other one not. Once you make the rules the same, the system will adjust, I think, much more quickly than people even uh, hope or expect. It can happen really radically quickly, but it requires rule changes. Thank you, Mark. We really need to move from a model of private profits and public losses to a model where everybody stands to gain from a collaborative partnership. Um, now I have a question for Alan. Um, Unilever is one of the largest multinational companies working with thousands of suppliers in the supply chain and its value chain. Tell us a little about how you are collaborating with companies in your value chain to advance sustainability and, and not just the ones in your specific value chain, but others as well, uh, your partners, your competitors, how to enthuse them into action. Thank you, Alan. Uh, sure. Well, look, uh, let me give a very simple uh, example uh, from our value chain, which is um, we believe that uh, sustainable agricultural practices are no longer enough. Uh, we've introduced a regenerative agriculture code where we will now work with um, tens of thousands of smallholders who supply our key commodities and help them switch to regenerative practices in our own self-interest. We believe it will be a more efficient model of agriculture. So that's a straightforward example of value chain partnership. Let me come, come on to uh, another example, which is um, technology partners. I'll give you two examples. Um, we are uh, absolutely focused on making sure that there's no deforestation associated with our supply chain. And that's where technology comes in. We're partnering with uh, advanced geomapping, an AI and machine learning company. And can you believe it? Simple cell phone tracking technology to be able to map our, the truck drivers who are bring, bringing commodities to the mills that we use and make sure that there is no deforestation uh, happening there. And then fin I'll finish with an example that builds on what Mark was saying, um, which is we strongly believe on a price on carbon, um, but that price on carbon is most effective when it's matched with high quality carbon labeling. We see a day not too far away when every Unilever product, in the same way as we put calorie labels on foods, we'll put carbon loads on all of our products. And when you match that ability to give people uh, the ability to make choice um, and have a price on carbon, then I think we've got a chance for the just system to change as quickly as Mark was uh, indicating it could. But it's incredibly difficult to do that. So we're working, we can't do it on our own. We need to work with, uh, we're working with Microsoft, but also industry groups, our, our competitors, our peers, so that we can standardize, capture, and report um, the carbon loads in our products. And then when we get the market really working through consumer choice and a price on carbon, then I think we give the planet a chance. 
Thank you, Alan. That's what true leaders do. And thank you for your leadership. Now, Valentina, you're the founder of the SME West Blue Consulting. We've heard about the value chain of major corporates, um, but what is the uh, contribution of smaller companies and, and how can we help them tackle the climate crisis much more effectively? Tell us a little bit more from your perspective. Okay. Um, thanks, Satya. We heard from uh, Shop about um, Unilever, uh, but we almost know that SMEs are an integral part of supply chains and serve as major engines of innovation, value creation, employing different labor force segments, as well as providing skill developing, de development opportunities. Also, you mentioned earlier, SMEs make up, up about 90% of business worldwide and represent up to 60% of the employed population. The contribution of SMEs should therefore be at the core of solutions tackling the climate crisis. These solutions include policies to reduce the impact on the environment, example, recycling, adopting energy efficient systems and paperless processes to name a few. SMEs also play a critical role in creating awareness and disseminating information to their communities and also the communities they serve. So there's a lot of ongoing effort as we speak in this direction from SMEs. And there are now more than double the number of real economy act actors that are committed to net zero targets than at this time last year. I applaud the efforts of the UN Race to Zero team in creating this momentum. We must keep going. Also last year, ahead of the UN Secretary General's Climate Action Summit, a grassroots movement of more than 2,100 Chamber of Commerce representatives making up more than 10 million local business leaders united to form the ICC Chambers of Climate Coalition and committed also to supporting the goal of achieving net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest. Now with already strained financial resources, a dearth of technical know-how and lack of access to interventions, the contribution of SMEs must be supported by supply chain leaders, institutions, and government to assure the holistic and rapid gains desired. So we look forward to seeing more of the collaboration points as illustrated by Mark earlier. This past September, ICC, working with the Exponential Roadmap, We Mean Business, and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change launched the SME Climate Hub. Now our aim with the hub is to provide a global one-stop shop of tools and support for SMEs to allow hard-pressed SMEs to be more competitive today while enhancing their resilience for years to come. And we really encourage everyone to find out more about the SME Climate Hub via our dedicated website which is smeclimatehub.org and to join this collective effort to build a holistic system capable of enabling SMEs to also build back better. Now I'm personally equally delighted to announce that my company West Blue Consulting committed to climate conscious practices such as the paperless solutions for governments has today made the formal SME climate commitment and is joining and putting all its efforts, uh, support behind this initiative, joining governments, businesses, cities, regions, and universities around the world that share the same mission. I am very confident that the tools and resources that this platform will provide will help companies make good on their climate commitment. So I implore all companies to log on to the SME Climate um, Hub and to join us in this initiative so that we can collaborate to co-create solutions to solve the climate crisis. Thanks, Satya. Thank you, Valentina. Now on to Mark. Mark, as you know, um, in the last few weeks, we've seen some tremendous progress in terms of commitments from countries to get to net zero. Um, China announced that they will get to net zero by 2060. 
then Japan, European Union, South Korea, 2050, Sweden has announced earlier that they'll get to net zero by 2045. And, and we all understand that energy transition will be at the heart of that possibility of between the, the bridge between the promises and action. And you've been a pioneer of renewable technology projects and you clearly understand the power of innovative technologies in enabling us to accelerate the race to zero emissions. And how significant will be the role of technology, especially green hydrogen, in our efforts to achieve net zero by 2050? Well, we, we can't ask everybody to just suddenly fork over their entire income to make the world a slightly better place. We, we need a competitive solution um, <clears throat> to keeping our cars on the road, <clears throat> to keeping our, our homes heated and all the rest of this. We, we've lived culturally for the last 100 years or so since we invented or discovered petroleum off the narcotic of really cheap energy, which is, you know, has done wonders for the world's wealth. Uh, we were also accidentally shooting ourselves in the foot without necessarily realizing it while we were doing it, all right? Now, suddenly we've all woken up, like, you know, the kid who waited till the night before his exam to study, and we've got to move very quickly. Now, we still need cars, we still need warm houses. We still need air conditioning. We still need food, which is an enormous consumer of energy. So we need to find a, an energy replacement solution that works. All right. Now, electricity produced by renewable resources is the obvious one. And that will take care of a very large part of the problem. We're, we're all going to discover 20 years from now that many more things are driven by electricity than are driven today. But it can't be all the solution because electricity can't do everything. For example, we can't use electricity to make nitrogen fertilizers, right? Which we need or else we can't eat. We cannot use electricity to make steel. We need something to reduce uh, iron oxide to make steel. This is where we need some um, newfangled solutions. And the obvious newfangled solution is hydrogen. So seven companies today have, have uh, been assembled, let's say, by the uh, climate change leadership. And the seven of us have decided to launch what we're calling the uh, hydrogen catapult, which I love the metaphor. We've got to put on our helmet and our dark glasses and someone's going to shoot us into the sky. The objective is to implement within the next five years, 25 gigawatts of hydrogen electrolysis. So what's the deal with hydrogen? Everything, every bit of energy we consume today, we burn something. The stuff that we burn has carbon in it. The byproduct emission is CO2, which is causing climate change. The only alternative is to use renewable solutions to create something that you can combust from water. And this is green hydrogen. So if you shoot enough electricity, which we can make with a wind farm or a solar farm or a hydroelectric plant into water, you can get the water, H2O, to, to divide. And once you have the green hydrogen, you have something that you can use in all sorts of interesting ways. You can move it, you can burn it, you can make steel with it. Um, it will fill in all the gaps where electricity by itself won't do the job. So who's doing this? There's seven of us in this... Uh, Catapult Together, um, Aqua Power, which is uh, uh, about to build probably the, the very first really large scale um, hydrogen plant in uh, Saudi. My company, obviously, CWP and Vision, which is a, um, a wind company, Iberdrola, Orsted, which is very famous for the stuff that they've done offshore, Yara 
which as far as I'm aware is the uh, world's largest fertilizer company and SNAM, which is the uh, Italian grid operator. And together, the seven of us are each gonna try and do something really big. Our little piece of the puzzle is a project in Australia, which when we get it finally built some years from now, will be the largest single energy project in the world, we think. Uh, and it's gonna make green hydrogen and it's gonna make green fertilizer. So together, I think the, the UN has, has um, helped us set the bar very high. And these seven private companies together are all up on, on the roof of the building and we're gonna jump. What we need is for the rest of the world to kind of set, raise uh, uh, something to catch us as we jump off the building. We need to see that carbon has a price and that people are motivated to use green hydrogen. We're going to take the price down from where it is today to under $2, which means we're going to basically make it competitive within five years with petroleum. We need a little help from the rest of the world to make sure that once we get that price down to that level, everyone is sort of induced to do it. And if we do that, we can make a revolutionary change in the energy market within five years. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm sure uh, um, we will have enough of uh, a threshold number of uh, uh, critical actors uh, that are listening today and, and around the world um, ready to support you in your uh, catalytic initiative. I'm talking about collaboration and partnerships. Um, Alan, Unilever has a long history of collaboration with the UN, um, but speaking more broadly, how can the private sector strengthen inclusive multilateralism? You spoke a little bit about it in your opening remarks. Could you reflect on the learnings from your collaborations? Yeah, first of all, um, I, I noticed, Satya, that my image has gone a little blurry, and I think it's tears of joy from hearing Mark talk some common sense about hydrogen. Um, uh, Mark, we're, we're converting one of our big industrial facilities in the northwest of England to see if we can uh, run an industrial plant on hydrogen. I think that's a lot more sensible approach than trying to shove it through domestic pipes. Um, but uh, anyway, great to hear uh, what, you're, what you're up to. Um, to answer your question, Sacha, everything that we achieve of note on our purpose-led brands is done in partnership. The reason why Dove is able to reach uh, 50 million girls with body uh, self-esteem images is through partnership with organizations like the, the Girl Guides and, and UNICEF. The reason why Domestis can put tens of millions of toilets into uh, homes in the emerging world to end the degradation of open defecation is because we work on partnerships um, on the ground and with uh, government and uh, non-governmental organizations. Our efforts to tackle food waste, our efforts to change the food system, not one of these can we manage to do uh, on our own. And all we need to do is find organizations that have got a similar goal, a similar purpose, similar values, and when you uh, work collaboratively with uh, other organizations, great things can happen. If you try to do everything within your own shell, uh, you're like, you're, you limit the potential impact, I would say for your business results, um, as well as positive impact in the world. Thank you, Alan. Um, I must say my eyes are tearing up now because I really believe in the power of partnerships. I have myself worked on uh, building uh, catalytic partnerships with millions of farmers. Uh, you talked about regenerative agriculture. That is something I did before coming onto this role with the United Nations. So thank you so much, all three of you for your uh, leadership uh, and insights uh, today. Uh, before we go, just in about 10, 15 seconds each, uh, tell us in one sentence what you would want the audience today to take away from this session when it comes to radical collaboration. Very briefly, uh, let's start with Valentina. I think I'll end by saying that in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
we're being forced to review several existing business and even government models that we took for granted. And this is a once in a lifetime opportunity that we must all take opportunity to co-create sustainable solutions for climate actions. So all hands on deck. Thank you, Valentina. Mark? Well, I, I've been very excited, obviously, the last couple of months with the uh, initiatives we've seen out of Chile and, and Asia on uh, commitments to net zero by 2050, and in Chile in particular with uh, commitments to hydrogen. But it's going to take the whole world. You, you simply can't do this unless you create a rules-based system. And rules-based systems demand everyone to agree in advance what the rules should be. And then once those rules are there to make sure they happen, it's got to be multilateral. It's got to be organizations like the UN, organizations like the International Marine Organization, which together create rules that everyone can live with. And if we have those, then it'll work. Thank you. Alan, the last word. Super quickly, none of us can solve the really big issues alone. Only through radical collaboration will we get to this sustainable, equitable growth uh, that the world needs. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Mark, for the insightful conversation. Um, and uh, it is now my privilege to introduce Ms. Patricia Espinoza, uh, Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change who will share with us closing remarks and a way forward. Dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to speak with you and I thank the Global Compact for organizing this Caring for Climate event and our colleagues at UNEP for their ongoing support and partnership. I also thank the climate champions for their ongoing leadership and dedication to keeping the climate agenda moving ahead. We're in the last days, in the last month of a year like no other, one that has been difficult and devastating for many throughout the world. Soon we will mark the end of the year, but not the end of our challenges. COVID-19 consumed the world's attention this year, but the pandemic did not put our existential climate crisis on hold. Despite lockdowns that temporarily reduced emissions and pollution, carbon dioxide levels are still at record highs and rising. In 2019, carbon dioxide levels reached 148% of pre-industrial levels. In 2020, the upward trend has continued despite the pandemic. In 2021, Vulnerable people will still be vulnerable. Weather events will continue to get worse due to climate change, and we will still see the string linking climate change to many of the world's most significant issues being pulled even tighter. We will also enter 2021 with something else, a new sense of optimism, hope, and momentum. I believe we can agree that the winds of change are shifting in a more positive direction than when this year began. The European Union has committed to become first climate neutral continent by 2050, and Japan, the Republic of Korea, and more than 110 countries have committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. China, has committed to get there before 2060. The Secretary General noted recently that this could mean that by next year, countries representing more than 65% of global carbon dioxide emissions and more than 70% of the world economy will have made ambitious commitments to carbon neutrality. It's a big could, but also an exciting possibility. A few months ago, it would have seemed a difficult prospect. It shows how quickly things can change and why maintaining a steady and consistent focus on achieving our agenda is so important. Those of you in this room, the national leaders, 
the business leaders, the policy analysts, and more. Each of you has worked hard to get us this far, in these most difficult of circumstances, and I thank you for your efforts. We will need you in 2021, all of you, like never before. Only by having everyone on board can we make the deep transformations needed to put us on a path for 1.5 degrees resilient future. To get there, business, cities, regions, investors, and civil society need to adopt net zero and resilience goals based on the latest science. All ministries and aspects of national planning need to embed ambitious climate and sustainable development goals across national planning. All stakeholders and citizens need to be empowered and feel part of the solution. And while we need long-term goals, we also need short-term results aligned with these ambitious visions. We know that science calls for urgent progress. So we also need to provide evidence that we are delivering concrete outcomes on our commitments. We also need to ensure that any lessons, innovations and solutions are shared with the global community in order to help developing countries and the most vulnerable. That's why this dialogue, your leadership, the work of the high-level champions, the Marrakesh Partnership, the Race to Zero, and the Ambition Summit is all so critical. We need all these parts working together in a unity of purpose. This must be accompanied by the fulfillment of commitments by nations under the Paris Agreement, the tabling of robust NDCs in 2020, a robust multilateral process increased climate ambition by non-state actors, and significantly more climate ambition by all. To do all of this, and especially to achieve success at COP26, we need more than technical discussions. We need political decisions. Those can only be achieved through multilateralism, trust and leadership. There are many areas where this need is evident, but perhaps none more so than finance. It can either be the key enabler for solutions or it can kill momentum. Particularly, there is a need for nations to mobilize the 100 billion annually that was committed under the Paris Agreement. We see the trillions being spent on post-pandemic recovery and realize that the 100 billion is but a fraction of this. In other words, this must be mobilized in order to establish trust. We cannot build a common trust that future commitments will be met unless we first meet past ones. Nobody said any of this would be easy, but it's necessary. We all know COP26 must be a success and that a significant amount of work remains to complete negotiations. However, we must remember that in order for COP26 and future conferences to be a success, we must show that systemic transformation is not only needed, but irreversible, and that there is the leadership, trust and willingness at all levels to stay the course. Dear colleagues, the next 12 months are going to be some of the most crucial months this process has ever experienced, and it will require unprecedented levels of cooperation and an embrace of multilateralism. But I'm convinced, based on what I have seen from all of you, that we can build on this new momentum. The Climate Ambition Summit is our next chance to indicate progress, which will propel us into the new year with a new spirit with COP26 firmly within our sides. All of this is entirely within our grasp. I look forward to working with you to achieve it. Thank you. And thank you, Patricia Espinosa, the Executive Secretary of UN Climate Change, for your remarks on how we can reach carbon neutrality goal by 2050. 
The call to race to zero is now in, more important than ever. Thank you all for joining us today for this important event. We're very grateful to all the panelists and to Gonzalo Munoz and Satya Chupati. Thank you for being our great moderators. We look forward to learning about the new commitments for transformative action. It's been a very inspiring meeting. As we've heard today, the green recovery efforts of many companies can help us reach zero carbon emissions by 2050. The UN Global Compact is committed to mainstream such leading corporate climate action, and we're ready to support through our local networks in close to 70 countries. Thank you again to the UN Environment Programme and UN Climate Change and the COP25 and COP26 climate champions. We really appreciate the leadership of both Gonzalo Munoz and Nigel Topping as the climate champions. All the videos from today can be found on the YouTube page, uh, the links are just there. And we invite you to keep the conversation going on social media. We're using the hashtags, our only future and caring for climate. Thanks so much for joining us from around the world today. Have a great day.